thank you guys for, for coming and thank you Anastasia for, for inviting me. I, it's great to be here and talk for a sort of extended period of time uh, about my research. I have my timer set for 40 minutes, so I won't go over that. Um, but I do have something like 60 slides, so I, I'm gonna try to, uh, to, to yeah, be, be as brief as I can. But um, basically, this is gonna be some work that, um, that I'm presenting as part of my uh, PhD project, where I'm very interested in the design of social media platforms and what that means for politics. And so what I've really tried to do is um, tailor this talk to the work that you guys are doing, and I've had some conversations with you, and, and, and so I have a sense of kind of what your interests are, and I think actually that's not so far from mine. I think there, there can be bridges, um, definitely in terms of the political space. So I'm gonna present basically three studies, and I'll talk a little bit more about them as we go along, but it's sort of coming from this idea, this, this argument that the design of a space influences how people act within that space. So. An example from Berlin, you have the, uh, the Holocaust Memorial, and if you look at it, what are you allowed and not allowed to do and move within this space? Is sort of the, the argument from a, from a physical space. And it's a similar argument for online environments. The design of a platform, the digital architecture, influences how users behave on that platform. So here's just a, sc a screenshot from uh, my Facebook page a couple of days ago. And you know you have a search bar. You can you can search things. You can post. Um, there's these different uh, social buttons like commenting and share. So what you're allowed and not allowed to do is influenced by how the platform is actually designed. So the sort of operational definition then is digital architectures are the technical protocols that facilitate, constrain, and shape user behavior. And what's key is that these are programmed in code by developers, so while we have these very like glitzy features on the front end, on the back end, it's, it's not so glamorous, right? Um, and just to plug, this comes out of some work that I've been doing with some colleagues uh, in Lund and Copenhagen, um, where our first stab at this was looking just at Facebook and Twitter and trying to think what aspects of those platforms might influence political processes, particularly how users engage with European politics. So um, I'll go into these a bit more in detail later, but the network, the algorithms, how far a post can travel, and what type of users on the platform, we argue, are specifically influenced by design features. Um, and I expand on that, and I'll go into it. But I just want to kind of briefly introduce the three studies I'm going to talk about. The first is to look at how digital architectures shape communication, um, particularly in the context of how politicians use social media to campaign. And then I wanna show how these architectures can be manipulated. And um, I basically conducted a little cyber attack during the, uh, the midterms, um, so I'll talk about that, which also has implications for disinformation. And the third is to look at how architectures and users interact and how that affects how people process information and their decision making um, through an eye tracking experiment looking at Facebook comments. So that's very preliminary, but, um, but I think you'll find it interesting. So um, the first paper, this is, um, it's got a very long title, but basically it's, it's comparing Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat in the US election. And the aim of the paper was to develop a typology that other scholars can use, particularly to focus on cross-platform research. And I'll get to that in a second. So these are the four platforms. And um, I use a little bit of data from the 2016 election to support that comparison. And I'm, I'm, I try to have a Christmas theme here. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> All right, so the theory, um, a little bit of theory behind this, um, the large majority of studies on social media typically focus on one platform, which I think is a problem when we look at uh, political campaigns because they're campaigning on multiple platforms, right? Those cross-platform studies that do exist, they tend to focus on citizens' discussions about politics and they do argue that design differences influence communication. So in this uh, study, this is a study that looked at Facebook comments versus YouTube comments in the context of, I wanna say it was gun rights and gay marriage in the US. And what they found is that because on YouTube you can be anonymous, you have a slightly more, uh, slightly more likely chance that the comments will be incivil or sort of hateful because people are anonymous. Whereas when they have their full identity on Facebook, they uh, tend to be more polite. So that's a design choice, whether or not you can be anonymous and have a fake name and a fake profile or not. So we also know that technology firms shape how uh, political campaigns operate. So there's people 
working for Facebook and Twitter that are actually coordinating with the campaign on a regular basis. But we don't know how the technology's design shapes communication. So that's kind of the argument. And have any of you heard of this term affordances? Yeah? So this, it's this idea that um, it's a sort of theoretical construct, uh, the relationship between a user and a technology. So the affordance of Twitter would be that you can be more visible or something along these lines. Um, it's thrown, a lot, thrown around a lot in my field, but uh, what I argue in the paper is that it, it's sort of conceptually vague. Um, it's, it's very stretched. Um, and this is a, a quote from a meta-analysis that looked at how the term affordances is, is used in communication studies. And what they say is that it, most of the time, or often, um, people talk about the affordances of a technology. So people will say, um, the affordance of Twitter is that citizens can broadcast their opinions to a large audience. But oftentimes you can just substitute the word feature in the literature. People say the affordances of Facebook allow people to do this, X or Y. What they're actually talking about is features. So that's kind of what I'm trying to, to argue here is that if we're going to focus on the features, let's focus on the features and not the possibilities that the features enact. So a bit abstract, but um, I saw this, this study from 1984 that looks at the affordances of stairs. So stairs afford climbability. They, they, they enable this possibility of climbing. And what I started thinking about is if we're trying to think about, okay, what's the affordance of a technology, stairs? It's, it's more empirically measurable to focus on the stairs themselves than the climbability. So you can measure how many stairs there are, the angle of each step, um, and by thinking more about the architectural design of the stairs, we can get at how climbable are they. Because there's lots of different types, yeah? Yes. It is, it is established, but the, the problem is that when it's used in the literature, people are talking about features of a technology. They're not talking about the relationship between the two. Yeah, exactly. And, and it, it, it's, it's problematic because it, it leads to this stretching. So you can, and I'll, I'll get to why this is important in a second. Yeah? The one difference between, like a crucial difference between affordances and features are that features are available, but then uh, different people can use them differently. Right? So a Twitter bot uses the same features as a human being uses, but a different affordances to the bot because of how they themselves are defined. This, you know, this can be, Mark Gibson talks about affordances, not just features, because how someone uses something is defined by who they are and their ability. I agree. I totally agree. And I'm going to get to that point in a second as well. But what I'm, what I'm arguing in the paper is in terms of objects of study, we should focus on the features, not the affordances, because this is a very vague, hard to operationalize concept. So getting to the idea of stairs, um, because stairs are a technology. So let's, let's think about a simple example and then move on to social media. There's different types of stairs, right? Um, if you want to compare across them, there are ways that we can, we can think about their form, their function, how users interact with them. Because even though technology is designed for one thing, it can be used by any number of people in any number of ways. So we can't actually predict how users will use a technology to a full degree of certainty. So to get to your point, my argument is that if we don't focus on the features, but only focus on the affordances, we might assume that there's a certain property of a technology that's not necessarily there. So this is an optical illusion from the New York subway where you would think there's a set of stairs. Does this afford climbability? Well, not unless we go and test what are the features because actually this does not afford climbability at all. So getting to the typology, um, I have sort of, sort of four broader um, uh, categories. And those are network structure, functionality, algorithmic filtering, and datafication. And I'm not going to go too in detail. You can, you can read them more about them in the paper. But I want to just introduce them here. So network structure is the criteria governing connections between accounts. And I have three kind of sub-properties of these. So one is searchability. How, how accounts can be searched? How easy to find are they? How is connectivity established? So on Facebook, you have to accept a friend request, or on Twitter, you just generally follow. And this has important implications because people's Facebook and Twitter network do not overlap. 
So one argument is that this design feature is a key uh, driver for that. And privacy. So users' privacy settings affects who can find them and also who can connect with them. And so what I do in the paper is basically uh, compare these platforms along how, how, is, how easy is it to search for a candidate on social media. So Facebook, it's quite easy. Twitter, it's a bit difficult because there's a lot of parody accounts. And Snapchat, you have to know the exact username. So it has a low searchability. So just to give you an idea of what I'm, what I'm doing in the paper. The second one, and this is kind of the one that's the most fuzzy for me, is functionality. So this is how content is actually created and distributed. And this is a massive category. I only really put five things here. But the type of hardware, whether the uh, device, sorry, whether the content is sent from a mobile phone or a desktop, for example, can have implications for political communication. The type of graphical user interface, the broadcast feed, what type of media does it support? Does it support uh, pictures and GIFs and videos? If so, are the videos capped at 30 seconds or one minute or 45 minutes? I mean, this has implications for what type of uh, content politicians can put out during elections. To what extent can you post across the same platforms at the same time? Like you can post something on Facebook that will also go to Instagram and Twitter. So uh, this is the massive chart that looks and kind of breaks down what are the limits of these platforms and, and their properties in terms of their function during 2016. Now, most of all this stuff has changed since then, um, but that's how it was then. So algorithmic filtering, this is how developers prioritize what content is shown to people, right? So for political campaigns, it's important because algorithms affect the reach of a post, how far it can travel, but they can also override it by boosting, right? And this is the, getting to the idea of, of platforms making money by filtering content and then incentivizing users to pay to promote it. And then datafication um, on the sort of what's produced out of these platforms is data. And the question is how do political campaigns collect, combine, and appropriate <laughs> that data? They do things like um, they match people from the voter file to their social media profile. They target them. They get the analytics in real time from those messages. And then they retest content. And um, that process is all detailed in in the paper, so I won't go there. But just to give you an idea of like what I, what I mean by this, this architecture's argument, if we look at hardware, Snapchat is only accessible from a phone, right? There's no web version of Snapchat. So what does that mean? This is, uh, so I did some interviews with um, some campaigners in the US, and what this means is that it affects the type of content you can actually show to your audience because you can't edit it. You can't bring it back to headquarters. Um, what's coming out on Snapchat is actually what the campaign is seeing. And this has implications for what type of messages are crafted. That's the argument. So if we look at the same event on Snapchat and on Instagram, we'll see that it's, it's hard to see a bit, but I mean, these are not very mobilized uh, supporters. They're not going crazy. On Instagram, where they can filter the photo, they can select when the candidate is centered, they can sort of project this image of the candidate, right? But on Snapchat, they lose that control a bit. And what I think is interesting about this example is here they say 2,500 people were in Dallas, and then here they say it was 4,000 plus. So this also has implications for fact checking and um, processing information, right? They can sort of take their time and publish this with the correct information. Things on Snapchat might not be that accurate because it has to be released on the fly. Um, just some other data from this study. Um, this is a graph looking at this cross-platform integration. So to what extent was the same content posted by politicians on Facebook and on Instagram? The black bars are um, content that was unique to Instagram. And the other two are whether um, this is whether it was the exact same content on Facebook and Instagram. And this was if the picture was the same, but the caption was different. And basically what this shows is that there's no uniform pattern. Um, People who are studying Instagram, they might assume that uh, all the pictures they're looking at is specific to Instagram. There's something about Instagram that, that makes this content uh, relevant for politicians. But actually, a lot of the same stuff is on Facebook. So it, this is kind of to warn people that don't assume that content on a platform is unique to that platform. And this gets to the idea of what type of media does the platform support, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, the findings of that paper, um, I had to sort of put something empirical out of it as well. 
And that is that across every platform, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat, the same content was present. So um, I don't know, and it's still open for research, what makes a politician campaign on one platform versus another. But um, looking at multiple platforms, you can see that actually a lot of the content isn't that different. It's also the argument that Facebook was the dominant platform of 2016 because of these features of its architecture. Accounts were highly searchable. They were not on Snapchat, and this caused a lot of frustration for campaigns. Um, it allows for hyperlinking. Instagram, for example, does not allow for hyperlinking except in a bio. So um, it's a key way to um, allow or to drive supporters to your website to get donations, which is key in US campaigning. The ability to override algorithms and um, reach a broad audience was uh, also important. And Facebook just has the best uh, micro-targeting platform. It's able to, with just someone's, what is it? Just their email and their home address, you can find someone on Facebook within 30 seconds. Millions, you can just put in a, an Excel spreadsheet of a million uh, email addresses and it will match them to their um, Facebook profile in 30 seconds with about a 70 to 80% match rate. So you can really scale this targeting. Lastly, uh, Instagram adoption was more prevalent than Snapchat, which I argue is because of Snapchat's um, limitation to only being on a phone. So that is the, um, the architecture's piece. And to going to what you were saying about the bots, it's sort of, I, I started thinking about, well, you know, platforms are designed a certain way, but they can also be manipulated. And um, I actually decided to do some of this manipulation um, myself. So uh, I was reading and I did a, I wrote a sort of a short piece about um, uh, cyber attacks on social media where uh, US government employees were targeted on Twitter to click a link that would infect their device. But it wasn't just that they would target their family members. And if the device was targeted, then they would crawl into the Pentagon's computer through the home Wi-Fi network. So like pretty malicious stuff. Um, and so I wanted to see whether I could replicate that, uh, that design. And <laughs> we, were talking, uh, we were talking earlier about the, the Nigerian scam. Um, and that's, that's this idea of phishing, right? This uh, email phishing. Um, but I'm gonna argue why Twitter's digital architecture is perfect. For, for spear phishing. And um, basically, I, I created a, a fake news bot to spread information to right and left wing people on Twitter to see whether their ideology or the type of device they use uh, influenced their likelihood to click disinformation. So, going back to this idea of platform design, if, if I ask you to go like think about how you would move through this, uh, this architecture, this would probably not be your first idea, right? This, this space is not created to run across uh, these stones, but clearly you can see how you would do that. But it doesn't come to you right away, I think, um, unless you're, I don't know, are into parkour or something. But platforms can be manipulated, is the argument. So this is a, uh, a kind of theoretical again, model of, of spear phishing I put together, where um, on Twitter you can collect data on your target, you can construct a fake profile, you can contact, um, depending on the design of the platform. Once the person clicks the link or gives you their credentials, um, then you can attack their friends and scale up the attack. So it's, it's pretty, um, I think it's, it, talk a lot about disinformation on social media, but this is a much more hardcore form of weaponry. Um, you can um, take down devices, uh, you just crawl across networks and the internet of things, like it's pretty crazy stuff. So this is also a big concern for Facebook. They released this, um, this influence operations like sort of report in 2017. And here we have, as some of their concerns, spear phishing, fake account persona, and the, the amplification of um, spreading fake uh, content. So in the kind of, you put that in the literature, you'd have spear phishing, disinformation, and bots. And so basically I wanted to run an experiment using these, testing these three, um, these three aspects. So why Twitter? Um, because its digital architecture is what uh, Shabra et al. call a Fisher's paradise. Why is that? Because it allows for account automation. It has open APIs that allow for this uh, collection of data called, um, in military terms, open source intelligence gathering, right? You can, people put so much information on their Twitter profile 
If you pull someone's Twitter timeline and analyze the timestamps, you can get a pretty good idea of when they wake up, when they go to bed, when they eat lunch, if they're an active Twitter user, which a lot of people are. Um, it supports these short URLs like Bitly and Google, and that's interesting because it hides the real identity of the link. When you at mention someone in the beginning of a tweet, they will get a notification, but it won't appear on their timeline. It'll appear in this tweets and replies section. So you can hide this type of attack from public view. And because of the way Twitter's architecture is, it doesn't have a lot of algorithmic filtering. It's mostly focused on chronology. It's pretty much, and it's kind of short bullet point format, it draws a news-oriented content profile. So people who are interested in news go to Twitter. And so um, what I did is I saw this, uh, I was like looking at DEF CON uh, conference videos, like this hacker conference one night, and I saw this really interesting presentation where these cybersecurity researchers built this program called Snapper. And uh, I basically retooled the program. So a lot of the credit goes to, uh, to these guys for this project. And what you do is you feed in a list of Twitter users. It scrapes however many tweets you want the program to scrape. So I have it at, I think, 200. And then what it does is it generates a message for that user based on what they've already said. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with Markov chains and Markov models. Basically what it does is it scrapes their tweets and then generates a message that's at least 70% different from an exact replica of a tweet. So what this means is that it's generating a message that's using the language of the user and putting back the interest of the user to the person. And then uh, within that, you at mention the user, you put the generated tweet, I added this little down emoji, because I think that would make people click, and then the short URL. Um, yeah, sent from a fake news outlet. So this is the Washington Post. This is what the Twitter uh, thing looks like. And then I used uh, this website, fiverr.com, where you can kind of pay people to do tasks. Uh, $5 to make uh, the DC News Report, which is the fake news account. And this is the link that uh, people would see. So I, I think you did a pretty good job for, for, for $5. It, you know, it's, it's good enough. I didn't put any information here because I didn't want uh, to impersonate a news outlet too much. You know, I was trying to keep this very simple, very basic. I didn't pump up the number of followers or anything. If someone would have went to this, they would have realized very quickly um, it was fake. So this is the link that people got. Um, it says breaking news. It doesn't really have any content other than there's an incredible scandal, but no parties are mentioned. It's both red and blue for both parties. So I tried to keep it as neutral as possible, but still be something that would generate some type of uh, interest. And then this is what everyone would see um, as the short link. So when they clicked, they got sent to this survey, <laughs> which says, thanks for checking out the DC News Report, and asked what device they're on and stuff. I was just interested to see if anyone would actually fill this out, and uh, eight people did. <laughs> so, so, and, and overall, there was 138 in the study, um, so not too bad, but uh, it, it differed, the responses. The only thing that was constant is that everyone filled in, they checked Twitter more than once per day, and previous studies show that actually the more you use social media, the more likely you are to be susceptible to a spear phishing um, attack, because it has something to do with like either you're, you're just trying to grow your network or, or something along those lines. Um, so that was the only interesting thing there. So I got ethics approval, it's GDPR compliant, it's not a real cyber attack, no one is maliciously um, affected, except, yeah, I'll, I'll give an example of the ethical implications in a, in a bit. So the data collection is, I, I'm interested in people who are expressing politics on, on Twitter. So um, I searched for the term midterm, which was right around um, the time of the Brett Kavanaugh hearing, so things were pretty heated. Um, uh, deduplicated the tweets, just kind of standard pre-processing stuff. Um, and, then, and then what I did is I, I picked only people who had between 50 and 400 followers. I wanted to um, get at uh, kind of ordinary users. So th this removes things like uh, famous people and marketers, anyone over 400. Um, yeah, so these ordinary, marginally influential citizens um, and scrape their tweets. If they use the hashtag MAGA or Blue Wave, so right and left wing, respectively, uh, they were put into this group. And then I did a, a, took a random sample of 10 tweets per user and coded whether at least eight were political and at least eight came from the same device. So that was kind of my, my variables. Um, checked to make sure they weren't bots. And um, I put them into 10 users per ideology times four days. 
that makes sense. So I did, I targeted 10 on Monday, 10 on Tuesday, 10 on Wednesday, 10 on Thursday. And then the next week added um, 98. But I made sure that for each 10, five were from a web, web tweeters and five were mobile tweeters. So basically I was just testing all this, all these different variables. Um, so this is an example of what the tweet would look like. I, I took the names out, but so this was to give you an idea of how well the Markov chains performed. Can't even begin to care about this. People talk like Trump is the crowd cheering and laughing at it deplorable. So then there's my emoji. Um, so it, it kind of makes sense. It's, it's not perfect, <laughs> right? But I mean, the, again, the, the idea is to keep this very low level to see if people will click. And then ideally, um, or it could be the case that a more malicious actor would have much more sophisticated technology to do this, right? Here's the example from the right wing. Um, yeah. Kind of makes sense, kind of not, but think if, if some, some news outlet is messaging you with kind of stuff you're talking about, maybe you, you click them. Yeah? Can I ask you more about the memory model you used? Yeah. The memory mm -hmm. So it's not coding, but like what kind of, is it like word by word? And based on like a single like word condition, or is it based on anything like uh... It treats, so it, it's, it's a Python package called Markovify, and it treats each tweet as a unique document. And basically, we'll, um, we'll create a message that does not, that is basically 70% variance from an original tweet. Because if you, if you do the same tweet, Twitter will, Twitter will block it. And you're using like a data set like 250 Yeah. Which is relatively small for many people. Like definitely, definitely. Yeah, again, my, my idea is not to, I could have, I could have juiced up the, you know, sophistication of it, but, I didn't want to do that. And there is a reason that I probably should have been more careful. That all includes, uh, hashtags, I includes hashtags. Hashtags are treated just as words. So to be honest, my sense is that it actually just takes kind of two tweets and just and merges them together. So you'll get like the beginning half of one tweet and the end half of another tweet. And it's exactly the same data. It's in that half, it's exactly the same data. Yeah, generally like these chunks are similar. So it's not taking, it's, yeah. Okay, it's not and, and, and so, what, so what, what these cybersecurity researchers did is they, they tested this against uh, deep neural network learning and found that they, they performed more or less the same in terms of click rates. So, um, I, and, and this is much, much faster than, than doing that. Sorry, one, one thing I, I don't understand is how do you make sure that your participants are actually exposed to that tweet? Like, because they get an at mention. I, I can't tell if they ever see it. But I know that they get a notification saying you've seen. But if these are like, as you said, your normal average people, it looks kind of very strange that a new user is like mm -hmm. tagging your name. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, but again, this is all to see. This is all to see whether ordinary people would would click. I mean, my original plan was to do this to politicians, but there's six hundred. There's six hundred of them, and it's. Yeah, totally. But the end, the end goal, the end goal is to get people to click. I want people to click. The end goal is to compare who's clicking and who's not. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, yes, I'm testing these variables to see if they connect, but the dependent variable is likelihood to click. Um, and of course, there's yeah, there's problems. And I mean, I'll be 100 honest with you, like, I, I basically reprogrammed and, and ran this tool. This was just a kind of hobby project. It's, it's out in first Monday. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's a, it's a, not every possible aspect of thinking this through was done before it was, it was done. Also because there was a time crunch with the election, I wanted to, to get it out. So the results is one in five people clicked the link. And there's, a, there's different click-through rates here, but the, Basically, the things I wanted to test, partisanship and what device were not significant predictors. So like way off, there was no, not even close to being statistically significant. Which basically, <laughs> I turned into the argument that everyone is at risk for being spearfished, regardless if you're left or right wing or uh, which device you're tweeting from. Of course, this is a, this is a biased sample. It's, a, it's, a, it's political users. It's only those that have a certain number of followers, of course. But still, I think it's somewhat interesting that 20% of people clicked. 
Um, and eight users, yeah, filled out the, uh, the survey. But <laughs> I kind of disregarded that from, from um, the analysis. Now, there is some uh, one ethical bump here that I hit. So this was a tweet, and eventually Twitter, Twitter blocked the automation. So that's why it's, I've deleted the account, so it's, um, it's gone now. But um, <laughs> basically, this is what I was saying, where it kind of splices two tweets together. So this was a tweet that uh, was about the caravan. And obviously, this is um, somewhat hinting at Trump, right? But I think this was probably something that this user said about someone else, like a Democrat, that got spliced into this tweet. So the, the way that this the machine generated the tweet sort of implied something negative about Donald Trump. And I did not sort of foresee this uh, type of thing happening. And I got a reply, which is pretty nasty. Um, so this person was really angry, obviously. Uh, and, and, and this is something I really wanted to do is I wanted to test the Trump effect. So I actually kept running the bot before Twitter shut it down and I had two conditions. One was just an arrow and then one said Trump in an arrow to try to see if just the mention of Trump would get people to click. And I think that's actually what got me shut down because it was too repetitive. But anyways, so yeah, so, so this guy was really angry and the, the ethical sort of issue is, okay, I lose control when using, a, I mean, this isn't necessarily black box. It's very uh, clear how this, thing, how this thing runs, but did this cause harm? And the ethical question that I'm still thinking about is, this is language that the user had already used. So it's spitting back a corpus that this user has made, or the, the training data is coming from the user, so therefore, can it be a breach of ethics if you take that person's, yeah? I did. Through, through uh, our, our... Mm. And what I argue in the paper is this type of thing has been done many times for surveys and, and to test cybersecurity. But in, in political communication, basically sets of bots have been used to solicit people to take surveys, unsolicited. And if you really want to test the cybersecurity aspect, you don't want to tell people you're going to send them a link. Right. And so this is something that I, I discuss in the, the paper. I mean, personally, I don't have much qualms with this, also because the way this person like, reacted. Um, but uh, what, what I tried to do in the paper at length is talk about how platforms can't control what's going on on their platforms. So they need independent help. And uh, the only way to really get at this, I mean, of course, you, there, there, you could have a controlled experiment where you're, you're doing this, but I actually want to run this live on the platform, not tell anyone, because that's what Russian trolls do, right? This is what, uh, if, if there's going to be an attack, they're not going to inform anyone beforehand. So I want to kind of keep as much validity as I can in that sense. So uh, I can imagine from a um, psychology standpoint, the type of things you work with, this, this would be maybe uh, looked down upon, but uh, I'm very much in an in a sort of environment where the platforms take away uh, access to data, then we have to find new ways to, to generate data. So we can also discuss this in the comments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, the, the Yeah. I mean the Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the research question was how and to what extent do, are citizens susceptible to spear phishing and disinformation on Twitter? And yes, it is a low sample size. Um, what also is hap has happened before I ran the experiment is Twitter created this huge bot purge, right? It removed, it's on the lookout for this type of stuff. So in and of itself, it's interesting that uh, I think you might cause a small sample size. Had this link been laced with malware, I could have infected 27 devices. Okay, if, if I was a well-funded Russian state operative, I would probably have a pretty advanced Trojan. That's, that's my argument. Um, so again, yes, this is not a, a full-scale full study. It is a, um, it was a test, it was a test. And I thought it was, a, I, I think it is valuable. I would have expected, for example, right-wing partisans to be more likely to click because we tend to think of uh, right-wingers being more susceptible to disinformation. And what's interesting, I think, about this is all of these experiments that are looking at exposure to disinformation and such, there's a difference between retweeting content and clicking on links. And actually, research, one study shows that 59% of URLs on Twitter are not clicked. So when we're studying exposure to disinformation, this is a bit different because we're looking at how many people actually showed interest in reading this story. And that isn't often tested in this type of research. Basically, there's a difference between counting retweets as a measure of seeing information and looking at clicking as an intention to read more. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, look, by no means is the study perfect. Definitely not. All right, so moving on to a, to a work in progress. I know I'm, I'm really running low on time. So I'll just present some preliminary results of a uh, of an eye tracking experiment where we did have a much more um, ethical uh, approach and got informed consent and all that stuff. Um, looking at um, the effect of Facebook comments on people's likelihood to share information. And in the context of this talk, uh, this is interesting because these architectures aren't by themselves enough, but the way in which agents actually interact with them is important. And um, so looking at that, we were interested in what effect do comments have on citizens' decisions to read and share news on Facebook? And what is the effect of controversy in comment fields on those phenomenon? So in the interest of time, I'm gonna run through, I'm gonna gloss over this part of the theory. But basically, when you're looking at a um, Facebook post, this was done in Sweden, by the way. Um, looking at a Facebook post, there are certain editorial cues that the publisher is in control of, right? They can choose the headline, they can choose the picture and the byline, and all that stuff. But what's interesting is that the architecture of Facebook allows for user-generated content cues, right? That can serve as cognitive shortcuts to finding out what is relevant. There's so much information on Facebook that um, it's, research shows that people do take these cognitive shortcuts in deciding what to actually read. So we know that likes basically have no effect. The number of likes just over and over again proves um, that people actually don't look at that as a measure of uh, anything, actually. Um, but we do know that negative comments in uh, online news portals tend to lead people to evaluate the news and issues in that news story uh, negatively. And we know that controversy drives more comments. So um, negativity, aggression, all these things tend to get more responses in online news forums. But the question is, does this actually increase people's attention to news and likelihood to share it on Facebook? So um, you guys are, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, with eye tracking. Um, these were our areas of interest. So we had the headline, the text, uh, photo, blah, blah, blah. Likes, reactions, and the comments. And what we did is we basically manipulated these to be either in agreement or disagreement. And um, we took a number of steps to, to use like the most common Swedish names and not using any immigrants' names to introduce racial bias or anything like that. Um, this is what it looks like. I don't, maybe you guys know what machines, but basically the eye tracker is down here. And this is us calibrating it uh, for, the, for the experiment. And yeah, this is mostly for people who don't know uh, eye tracking. But as you can see, it's not perfect, but it gives us an idea of where people are looking. And as you'll see, um, 
they don't even look at these metrics down here at all. Um, so, but the, the way we chose these, I think, is quite interesting. So we wanted to actually use real Facebook data again. So we took uh, all the posts that the API would give us from 2017 from Aftenbladet, this is the most popular tabloid in Sweden. Uh, we selected four posts from five new genres, uh, business, politics, culture, society, and sports. And we took those, we selected those based on how close they were to the median number of shares, which I think was 49. And we moved up or down, just finding stories that were, were more or less about these, about these topics. And um, we presented 20 posts randomly to a convenient sample of Swedish uh, students. We assessed their likelihood to read and share the news story after being presented with the stimulus. And then afterwards, we surveyed them on their social media use. And we're, st and actually, we've upped this to 85. And so we're rerunning the numbers. Um, we had a very, we had a highly female bias in this one, and we've corrected that. So um, the survey results aren't different. So we don't really expect much to be different uh, here, but I'll just present this briefly. Um, looking at the dwell time, so how long they spent on the editorial part of the post, so the, the news part, um, because some of our participants didn't look at the second comment, so they weren't exposed to the agreement or disagreement condition. So we removed those, and only those who, looked, who received the condition, we tested how long they spent on the news story, so that top half of the post. And it turns out that when the comments were in disagreement, especially in political news, people spent more time sort of validating the post, checking it out. So uh, this was um, statistically significant, but mostly because of the politics and uh, society um, sort of drove it up. But across the board, except for sports, it seems that if, if people are showing disagreement in comments, people go to check out the, the post more. Um, no real effect on read. People's self-reported likelihood to read the article. Um, just nothing was nothing really came out there. Sharing, we do have a small but statistically significant effect that the comments did actually decrease people's likelihood to share. But the caveat is these are people's reported uh, likelihood to share out of 10. So basically, we're looking at people who aren't going to share this news anyways. <coughs> and that's a problem because we, in our survey, we basically found this asks, uh, in the past week, have you shared anything on Facebook? And like, we just have a sample who's not sharing in the first place. Um, the news was from 2017. It was also news that was sort of mildly interesting. It was median number of shares. So we have a problem there with our, with our sample. I'm looking at Facebook. Um, but yes, I don't think there's anything here that hasn't been said. I'm going to just um, wrap up this study which says basically that the comments matter. How, how comments are framed and, and the engagement there does seem to affect how users evaluate news. Um, on, this is positive for democracy and that citizens' voices are represented in the public sphere, but quite negative if um, controversy decreases sharing. What does this mean about flames and trolls? So basically, takeaways from this talk. Um, I tried to argue that platform design is an overlooked area of study, particularly, particularly in communication subfields. It's very difficult to draw a causal link between platform design features and content. That's what I'm working on, and I've got some interesting ways to test that uh, that I can tell you about in the Q&A. Um, these architectures are flexible, but they're also easily manipulated, particularly when the design features allow for account automation and uh, external third-party software to be plugged in. Uh, users and architectures interact that create norms and can affect um, how users evaluate news, for example. And more research, I think, should try to include features as variables in explaining um, behavior or political phenomenon or whatever uh, happens to be your interest. So thank you. I hope I didn't run too long, but I'm looking forward to your questions.